welcome to the channel. My name is Annalisa and today I'm going to be telling you about the books I read slash finished in the second week of the Monsterathon. So my second week and the beginning of my third week uh, have really not been as good as the first week, partially because I haven't been reading manga, but also I was camping the first week and I had nothing to do but read, whereas here I have access to some things I've been a bit obsessed with, <laughs> including Fire Emblem once again. And once again, uh, my first review can be an audiobook that I listen to while playing that. And that is The Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula K. Le Guin. Pretty old book. Don't remember what year it came out. I think it's middle grade or younger YA. I think it covers the ages between about 12 and 20-ish for this young wizard. It is a lot like parts of the Lioness series by Tamar Pierce or a few of her other series that focus on the schooling and growing up of someone over several years. So like Alana the First Adventure covers four years of Alana learning to be a knight or a page at uh, this royal school for people to learn to fight and stuff and then the next book covers the next four years so this is kind of like if you put those two together because it covers about six to seven years of this boy's life and it is about how he becomes a wizard of earthsea which is a geographical area i think i'm really good at paying attention to audiobooks clearly and understanding what's going on so our main character is named ged at least he becomes named that a little ways in and he starts out as a peasant boy from a village on a little island in a group of islands, an archipelago, and he is the son of, I think, a farmer or a rancher. And when he is pretty young, he figures out that he has magic and that he can do some spells, which not everybody can. And he becomes apprentice to a local witch, and then he goes on through the years that we're following him to get another apprenticeship with a madge, which is of a higher order than a little local witch. And then he ends up going on to a school full of madges. And there are some incidents there that reminded me a bit of Akata Witch in that there were competitions uh, between children, students of magic about who was stronger and whether people could do things or not. And Ged ends up doing something very stupid to show off and ends up getting into powers he shouldn't. And then what becomes of that incident really guides the rest of the book and is what and his happening to reckon with what he did then and the powers he awakened and the stuff he messed up there is <sighs> is the driving force of the rest of the plot. Uh, while he is also doing other interesting things like confronting dragons to try to avoid dealing with this one thing that he did. And I really enjoyed it. At first I wasn't sure if I was going to when I was first getting into it. I was very excited about reading something by Ursula K. Le Guin because she's such a, a big female fantasy author from kind of the pioneering days. So I would like to read as much of her work as possible gradually. But as it was starting out, it was a little slow to start slash I didn't really like the main character. Part of that is because he's, he's the kind of person who feels the need to be better than other people. Uh, and hence his big problems. Similarly, in Akata Witch, the character who is not the main character who does that stupid thing, I don't really like her either. But as the book went on, we also found a lot of really nice things about Ged, and he actually grew a lot as a character, which doesn't always happen. A lot of characters in books I've been reading recently, there hasn't been a huge amount of character growth. They're kind of the same person at the beginning as the end, which I don't mind, but uh, sometimes it's really interesting to see that character growth and see uh, how doing a stupid thing actually does change them instead of just they don't feel bad about it at all and go on be, do, to do other stupid things. It's very irritating. Uh, <laughs> so it was really cool to see Ged learn from his mistakes and go on to do all sorts of 
things that he wouldn't have done not just because he didn't know how to do them before he went off to med school but but he's the type of person who would risk his life to help other people and who would care this much about other people now that he's gone through these experiences i really like that aspect and i'm having a bit of trouble putting some of my feelings about this book into words because it it gave me sort of a nostalgia, a really enjoyable nostalgia for books I read a long time ago, but it all it didn't feel like any specific thing that I can remember reading. But it also distinctly has the feel of older fantasy when things were expressed in different ways and it's got that sort of uh, one thing then another then another type plot rather than one story arc it has a bunch of mini plots and could easily be made into a series like a tv show rather than a movie uh, which was very common in a lot of old fiction especially fantasy i think the thing it most reminds me of is c.s lewis's work especially narnia which would explain the nostalgia it's very because I haven't read those in quite a while, but when I did, I loved them and they were a huge part of my childhood. Uh, but it's also very different. It's a lot darker than that. Part of it, I suppose, is that a lot of the middle grade I've been reading has been very light lately. Not in a way of being shallow, but just is a lighter way of talking about deep topics, whereas this was quite heavy and had a lot of death themes and broken things not being able to be put back together themes and that reminded me a lot of that series over there the del Toro series uh, and once again it's it's hard to identify that because it only has some things in common in other ways it's vastly different so uh, it's a bit hard to quantify but I really enjoyed listening to this audiobook also the audiobook itself was really good. The narrator was amazing and I think partially it is that the text really lent itself to that. The way it was written I think had a lot of, you know when a writer is writing it not in first person but they still include the voice of the third person main character to determine how the how the prose is expressed and so when exciting things are happening the sentences are shorter and kind of run together and when things are uh, funny there's humor in it and stuff like that and the narrator did a great job he was like half laughing as he was speaking at the funny parts and he spoke really quickly at the urgent parts and he spoke really slowly at the parts that called for that he did a great job i really love that audiobook so i highly recommend either a regular copy or the audiobook of the wizard of earth sea by ursula k Witt. At the end of the first week, I realized that my team, the Beast, was quite behind uh, on the the villagers terrified count uh, on the the spreadsheets for everybody. So <laughs> right away that night, I went and read all three of the short stories from an unnatural creatures that w uh, were assigned. So I read the Beasts, the Haunts, and the Conspiracies. One ones. Uh, so uh, those three were, let me see if I can find the table contents. So those three were the dot, which is this line thing, the griffin and the minor cannon, and come lady death. And so my groups was the griffin and the minor cannon, and uh, I thought there was going to be a cannon in it, which was silly because there's definitely only one N in the in the title. I didn't know what a minor canon was. It's a priest type of a person, vicar, basically. A small local one. And so that was the story of a griffin making friends with a minor canon and how that goes down in this little village. And then the spot one is about a, a two-dimensional evil creature uh, that comes and invades someone someone's house and then come lady death was about the uh the character of death you know the scythe person 
that type of a person uh, but a new and different take on it and on how and a bit like some versions of the Santa Claus story where they where it is a real person who turns into the mythical person and then they eventually pass on that duty to someone else and that was really interesting I really like that and thus I racked up 400 points in bonuses and like only 60 pages I think about between those three short stories they're very short uh, and I haven't read the rest of these short stories but I would like to at some point because those ones are really creative and inter interesting and would probably be inspiring for my own work then I think I read this one because it was another one that was uh, quick to read and quick to rack up a few points which was The Sleeper and the Spindle by Neil Gaiman who was the same person who Put together this collection so he wrote this one and he assembled this one with other people's stuff and this is illustrated by Chris Riddle because the illustrations are a huge part of this book there's one there's illustrations I think on every page yeah and things like that and they're really lovely and <laughs> I was wondering why some of the illustrations look really familiar in a certain way especially let me see if I can find it there was a particular one where the, the way the face was drawn was very familiar. This one. How her eyes are set in her face and things like that reminded me a lot of Coraline and indeed this illustrator worked on Coraline. So that's what that was about. And I really enjoyed all the illustrations, but I also really enjoyed the story. It is a retelling of Sleeping Beauty, and much like with uh, the language of thorns, who the bad guys are and who the good guys are are all switched around, and there's a lot more character characterization of the main characters and who they are, and also it is the prince-ish character uh, is a lady, she's a queen instead. And this story is actually set in a world where a lot of fairy tales are happening. So the queen is someone who was Snow White. She had an evil stepmother and she was asleep in a glass box for a year and she had her prince wake her up. And so now she's queen and she goes off just before her wedding with this prince to go save this castle that has been put to sleep. So I really, really like that. And she's accompanied by three dwarves who had been her friends for a long time. So I liked that a lot. And that was for the sacrifice prompt because it was in, in an unhaul video by Spencer's Library. Uh, then we have The Wild Robot, which I started while I was camping and finished last, well, no. Yes, I finished it at the end of last week. And it is a middle grade read about it's got illustrations too that I really like and it is about a robot who washes up on the shore of an island and has to figure out how to survive there and it is about how she becomes wild in order to survive in the wild and it includes a lot of talking animals and she eventually learns the language of the animals and is all about how she engages with them and with the island and nature and it occurred to me at the end of our camping trip that this would have been really good to read around the fire because just the intonations and the way the story is told with the really short chapters would really lend itself to a reading to other people situation so if you're interested in that kind of thing or you have kids you want to read to which my family did a lot in the olden days that's when we read Narnia this might be a good option for that uh, it was plodding along quite calmly with little bits of excitement here and there throughout the whole thing and it was really interesting but it wasn't scary in any way but there is a big climax near the end where there is a lot of uh, you're quite nervous and <laughs> I really enjoyed that I really enjoyed that it could do both um, this really calm nice reading along hanging out uh, surviving in the forest and then have this very high stakes stuff go on at the end. The only part I don't like is that it is open-ended which is the thing that people like to do for some reason. I don't understand why but people like that. I don't uh, but it is open-ended so be aware of that if you're not into that. I had to ma imagine up the ending for myself. 
why can't you just tell me everyone was happy? Why is that so hard? It's so much more satisfying. Anyway, uh, and that one was by Peter Brown. Then we have The Werewolf of Paris by Guy Endor, which I showed you I was reading at the beginning of my camping trip, and which I decided to slow it down on because it was really dark. And this, what was going on in this changed a lot from the beginning to the end as I figured out where the author was going and what the kind of purpose of it was, which was really interesting because I wasn't expecting a whole lot of it. Once I got about halfway in, I was like, this is going to be sad and depressing and and a lot like other classic fiction that was kind of that like tried to teach a moral lesson but failed at it but actually this was quite good in that way to start off i'll let you know this is about the birth and growth growing up of a werewolf which i'm pretty sure you know from the beginning if you know from the title and from the goings on and it is mainly told from this perspective of someone in the same household as the young werewolf who is trying to figure out what is going on with this kid and is trying to protect the kid but also protect people from the kid and a really interesting aspect of this is that it is somewhat found footage style because at the beginning of the tale we are introduced to someone who has found a history that has been written down by this person in the household of the werewolf and the premise of the book is that this person who found the manuscript is now annotating it and adding to it and turning that into something that can be published it's as if he is reporting on this thing that he is reading kind of like found footage which adds a lot of realism and a lot of acting like this is something that actually happened Another interesting aspect is that it has a lot of that Jane Austen type humor and commentary where she talks about the nature of all the landed gentry is who she works with and about how she talks about how silly and she expresses how silly she thinks they are while just describing how they think and that sort of sarcasm or irony, depending on whether you're British or American, those have different definitions. This book has a lot of very similar ways of talking about people and making fun of people and the way they think. And I was really fascinated by that. Most of it doesn't come in until the last quarter of the book, but there is some of it throughout. Also, this is the darkest thing I've read in a long time in that I define dark somewhat differently than other people sometimes. Like, a lot of death, just death, I don't consider to be very dark, but things like body horror and is more what I consider dark, and there's a lot of that in here. Especially body horror, but a lot of nasty sex stuff too. By that I mean non-consensual stuff and also, uh in other ways manipulative or incest and things like that and also a little bit of that thing with the dead bodies necrophilia almost not quite there is an overlap in this werewolf's life we get some of it from from his perspective there is an overlap between his wanting to eat something and his wanting to have sex with it that combined with the amount of detail that is in, put into that and the cruelty that is seen in various characters throughout is more what I consider to be dark in a book, which is why it took me a long time to read. It was depressing. But along with that social commentary aspect, there is some commentary on what makes a monster and what makes a man, which is a quote from my most, <laughs> from one of my favorite movies, Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, the Disney version, in case you're wondering. And so that was really interesting, the whole, uh, so because this could also fit in with the real monsters prompt where there were very monstrous humans in here as well as this werewolf. So that was really cool and I actually do really recommend this if you've got a strong stomach and if it's not going to trigger you with those other issues. Especially if you're a writer and you want to know more about how monsters have been portrayed historically and about just commentary on the nature of 
what makes a monster. So that's all I have read. I have some plans to hopefully pick it up in the next two weeks approximately. I hope to read all of these in those next two weeks. Maybe not this one. This might be a bit much. It's over 500 pages, but these ones at least, especially these three because they fit prompts, but this one I got, I actually own. I got on pre-order and I think it'd be really good for this monster thong because <sighs> look at the cover. She's got like blades and skulls and snakes on her throne. I think that'd be pretty fitting. But this and this are my biggest priorities because I haven't read them yet and they're prompts and I would like to get reviews out of them. Whereas this one, well it is for a prompt, I have also already read it so uh, you're not <laughs> waiting for me to review it because I already did. But that is how my second week of Monsterthon has been going. Thank you so much for watching. If you are also taking part, comment below. I would love to see anything you've been making about it and just hear how it's going for you. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!